Good morning and welcome to worship this day. We are pleased you have gathered with us either in person or virtually um, here with Christ Lutheran Church in Cottonwood, Minnesota. It's where the Spirit, Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. And no matter wherever, whenever, or however we gather together, God is present with us. Let us join together in the words of welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And as we enter into the words of faith this morning from Psalm 107, maybe Psalm 30, I think it's Psalm 30 today. Let us close our eyes for a moment and just gently breathe in and breathe out. And feel the Spirit of God enter in. I invite you to rise and body your spirit as we join our voices together in our opening words of faith. I will praise you, O Lord, for you have kept me in safety. You did not let my foes rejoice over me. O oh Lord, my God, I cried out to you for help, and you healed me. You brought up my soul from the depths. You restored me to life. So sing praises to the Lord, O oh you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. And hear the good news. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
receive the greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit to be with you all and, and also with, with you. you. And let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the Book of Lamentations, the third chapter. The Book of Lamentations is one of our most important sources of information about the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 587 BCE. Though the people admit that God's judgment was just, today's reading declares a fervent trust that God will not leave them forever, beginning with the 22nd verse. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians from the 8th chapter. Paul encourages the Corinthians to honor their commitment to participate in the collection his churches are organizing for the Christians in Jerusalem. He presents Jesus as an example of selfless stewardship and reminds them that Christians have received abundantly so that they can share abundantly. Beginning with the seventh verse. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this manner I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may, may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise and body your spirit. Due to the length of the gospel reading this morning, I'm going to invite you to be seated. Snuggle in with your loved ones as we hear the reading from Mark. 
Jairus, a respected leader, begs Jesus to heal his daughter. A woman with a hemorrhage was considered ritually unclean and treated as an outcast. Both Jairus and the unnamed woman came to Jesus in faith, believing in his power to heal and bring life out of death. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Beginning with the 21st verse. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. And now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at Jesus Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. And let us pray. Gracious God, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set the fire of the Holy Spirit in them. Amen. I have a confession this morning. I have never been so late for things before I became a pastor. (laughs) A late arrival before being ordained was 10 minutes early for appointments. (laughs) And now I can sometimes squeak by on being barely on time, but sometimes late. Over these 10 years, I've been creative in making appointments. Instead of saying that I'll be there somewhere at 1, 
I'll say 1, 1, 15, or my favorite, one-ish, whatever that means. Now, I'm confessing this for a couple of reasons. First of all, just in case I've ever made an appointment with you or will do so in the future, that you will have a little grace. Secondly, I confess this because pastors often get a bad rap about managing time efficiently or inefficiently. I think that some people believe that we just get distracted or lose track of time, but it's a little different than this. You see, it actually happened to me a couple of times this week, arriving at one-ish instead of exactly on the hour for some appointments. No, I was not distracted. I was wholly interrupted. Now, I realize that there is a fine line between the two. One is self-inflicted, a distraction. The other is caused by someone else, a holy interruption. See, these holy interruptions have become something that I cannot anticipate, but I actually like and enjoy because each day is different and each day is so unpredictable. I found that my best moments of the day are the holy interruptions. Those knock-knocks on the office door, the woo-hoos of the text messages, the ping of an email, the ring of a phone call. Those moments of, Pastor, do you have a moment? Is now a good time? I often see in the person's eyes and in the voice of the person on the phone, in the email or the text message, in anticipation that I will say yes. You see, my holy interruptions are someone else's importance. And this makes it important and valued by me. This is what is happening in our gospel text today. Jesus is not distracted. He wants desperately to go and help Jairus' little girl, but the hemorrhaging woman's needs are important too. Jesus has a holy interruption. This interruption helps to remind you and me that sometimes the Holy Spirit breaks into our lives. Henry Nouwen, a well-known theologian, teacher, and minister, once shared about his frustrations of the many interruptions to his work. The story says that he had a heavy agenda each day as he was teaching at Notre Dame, and he did not like to be interrupted. And one day, it dawned on him that his interruptions were his work. He said, life is what happens to you while you are making other plans. Have you not, too, found that interruptions spur of the moment plans are of greater consequence than what you were doing or planning to do? Jesus was planning to immediately go and help the daughter of Jairus, but the woman's needs were of greater consequence at that moment. Yet there were also some societal interruptions that occurred in this gospel lesson as well. Let's start back at the beginning. Jesus is coming back across the sea again, and here he is interrupted at the shoreline by the crowds. Then Jairus comes on the scene. He is one of the leaders of the synagogue and a wealthy and influential member of the community. And as one who would have been used to respect and results, Jairus steps up directly to Jesus. Yet he humbles himself before Jesus by falling at his feet, begging on behalf of his little daughter. And let us not forget the fact that the whole village is witnessing this act of begging for the help of Jesus, not just once, but the text says, begged Jesus repeatedly. And let us not forget the fact that he is taking a huge risk, damaging his reputation by doing this. And let us not forget the fact that other religious officials of the day had already decided that Jesus was dangerous and should be killed. The life of Jairus had been interrupted. 
Nothing mattered in life to him anymore. His reputation, his societal status, his life's work, or his own pride. Any pressing matters in life just faded into the background and became pointless in the face of possibly losing his daughter. Things he valued days, hours, and even minutes earlier lost their meaning when someone he loved could possibly slip away. I can just see the look on the face of Jairus as he approaches Jesus, a look of desperation, but also a look of anticipation that his answer will be yes. A man who said, my little daughter is at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Jesus immediately gets up to leave with him and nothing else matters to Jesus in that moment. Jairus must have been so hopeful in his thinking, no, believing that his daughter was going to be saved. His daughter would have a chance to live. As Jesus and Jairus began their trek, another holy interruption occurs. A woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years dares to reach out and touch the tassel on Jesus' prayer shawl. The text says that she had suffered and endured much under many physicians, healers, and spent all of her money searching for a cure. And yet she believed that if only she could touch the cloak of Jesus, that she could be saved. She dares to do it and feels that healing power go through her and knows that her hemorrhage has stopped. But remember, remember that Jesus is on the way to heal the daughter of Jairus, one who is on the brink of death, and Jesus suddenly stops in his tracks and asks, who has touched my clothes? Looks, look into the eyes of Jairus, the look of fear enters back in as he feels his anxiety rising as he knows the interruption may cost the life of his daughter. Then look into the eyes of the woman. The look of amazement and hope has replaced the look of anxiety and fear. She knows what she has done was societally wrong. Jewish law would have required that she remain outcast from her family and her synagogue life. She interrupts this Levitical law that says because she was menstruating that she was considered unclean. And then a seven-day purification time would need to pass before she could be considered clean again. The law also says that anyone who comes into contact with her is also considered unclean. They would have been required themselves to immerse themselves in a ritual bath but before they would be allowed to re-engage with others and their ritual, religious rituals. So for 12 years, she would have been considered an outcast from sites of public worship and her family. The fear the woman must have overcome to touch the fringe of the cloak of Jesus must have been immense. And Jesus knows it. And she again overcomes her fear and tells Jesus, it is her that has done such an abominable thing and tells him the whole truth of what she has done. Can you imagine? Jairus, the synagogue leader, would have known that Jesus was now tainted, unclean himself. Could he still save his daughter? This holy interruption of the woman may well have cost the life of the little one. And then the worst comes by another holy interruption when the word of some people from his house tells him that his daughter is dead. And Jesus tries to calm Jairus by saying, do not fear, only believe. And continues on with Jairus to his home. Through what could only be a miracle, the story ends with Jesus taking the hand of the daughter and saying in Arabic, Talitha kum, which means I say to you, get up. And she does. She was not dead, but only asleep. Jesus interrupts death. Now in all of these two healing stories, I can think of people in my own life 
the ones that I have prayed for and ministered to that were not healed and made well. Why do some of them get healed and others do not? I simply do not have an answer to this question. What I do know is that faith and healing do not always come in a physical way. Healing, being made well, can either come through a physical healing or through eternal life with God after death. It is here that we are invited to respond with faith and belief to the words, Talitha Kum, with a thrill of anticipation and hope. As I looked at this reading for today, that Greek word used for made well or healed is the word sozo. Its literal meaning is to be saved. It is more than physical wholeness. Both the daughter and the woman who touched Jesus were saved. Jesus comes to save us too. Jesus interrupts our lives, holy interruptions to make each day new for us through forgiveness and grace, saving us. Jesus interrupts our lives in the midst of illness, pain, and suffering, sometimes by relieving the physical pain in this life, and sometimes by raising the physical dead to eternal life. Salvation. My friends, this daughter and woman are you and me. Are you willing to let Jesus interrupt your lives for his offer to love each one of us, to make us whole again through his own death on the cross where he refused to save himself? Are we willing to let Christ fill the holes of our wounds and aching, grieving hearts by replacing our fears with peace? As it says in the reading from Lamentations today, Great is your faithfulness, and I will hope in the Lord. For the generous act of love in the life and death of Jesus, we give thanks to God. And let us pray. Gracious God, sometimes we cannot understand the holy interruptions you place in our lives. We pray for the release of the bleeding in our hearts and bodies and for you to fill our wounds with healing. Yet when we turn to you, reach out to you, show us how to let go of our fear and anxiety and discover where your power of healing love and peace are surely present. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us come before the triune God in prayer for all those in need. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across borders, from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel, that through your good news all might experience transformation. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides our food. Continue to water the earth for crops to be productive and thrive. Encompass the earth with your tender care and encourage our stewardship as your disciples. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Righteous God, we pray for leaders of nations, states, and communities. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them towards a fair distribution of resources that none among us would have too much or too little. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Pastor Janelle especially today on her birthday. Continue to guide her as she ministers to this congregation and bless her with peace and good health. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, your touch has the power to make us whole. We pray for those who are suffering from addictions, hunger, homelessness, physical or mental illness. Embrace those who have asked for prayer, especially Kelly, Sandra, Brooks and Isla, Brody, Cole, Norm and Grant, Bob, Terry, Lane and Bobby, Lloyd, Savannah, and Jean. Surround them with your unwavering presence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for this assembly and all those gathered together in worship in this sanctuary and the sanctuary of their homes. Revive our spirits, renew our relationships, and rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives have pointed us towards you, especially Neil Dovery's mother, Norma Dovery, and Shar Bodhi's aunt, Orla Tim. Envelop their families in your love and the promise that we will be reunited with one another in the last days. Give us peace in the promise of baptism that will be given to Quinn Lawaji later this morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Please share a sign of God's peace with your neighbors in whatever way you are comfortable.
When you are ready, I invite you to be seated. A few community announcements to lift up this morning. The flowers that you see up front here have been gracing us um, from the funeral yesterday for Irvin Schwartz. And we thank June for her generosity in sharing them this morning. In a couple of weeks, on Sunday, uh, July 18th, in the evening from 7 to 9, or whenever we decide to end, is our next fellowship fun night. In the gathering space um, out these, the side door here, you see a painting, a canvas painting out there. We will have an opportunity for uh, people to make that canvas of the footprints in the sand, um, just to help with uh, materials and resources to make sure that we have enough just jot your name down if you think you might be able to make it for that. There will be other items to do that evening, outdoor games, just opportunities to sit around picnic tables and enjoy some fun and fellowship together. Um, also, I think we'll probably have the bonfire pit going again. And um, let me tell you, the grasshopper s'more was amazing. Yum. <laughs> All ages are welcome. Uh, no quilting this week. Uh, they will gather again on July 20th, so make note of that if you are part of the quilters. Um, this afternoon, uh, there will be a celebration of life from 2 to 4 for Elaine Hamner, mother of Karen Giel. It will take place at their home just over on Lake Street. If you haven't picked up your Christ in, your, in our home devotional books, they're available right inside the front doors of the church. Go ahead and grab one out of the basket. Um, if there is not a large print left, please let me know. I do have a couple more in my office. Also, thank you for the ways that you give to this congregation. The offering plate is at the back of the church. I invite you to uh, give as you can. And let us pray in thanksgiving. Let us pray. Living God, we, we give, give you, you the, the things, things that are yours our skills, our time, our possessions, ourselves. Bless us in these gifts. Move us to works of faith and labors of love for the good of all your people. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we venture to the sending blessing this morning, um, I am very well aware of the conditions of our crops right now. And so, as churches in this area this day, we have promised one another to pray specially for the crops in the water that is needed. So let us pray. O oh God, giver and sustainer of life, in this time of need, send us the gift of rain so that we may receive the fruits of the earth for our benefit and for your praise. We give thanks for the fruitful earth which provide, produces what is needed for life. Bless those who work in the fields. Grant favorable weather to all engaged in agriculture. And help us to ensure that all people share the fruits of the earth, rejoicing in your goodness through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Receive the blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us. Be upon you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace. You are the body of Christ.